I'm going to turn this over to Dean Lauren Lindstrom, who will introduce our, our guest today. Thanks so much. Nice to see everyone. I'm glad you could be here. I'm really happy to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Maximus Sofotho, who's actually sitting down the hall from me. Uh, if you don't recognize that background, he's sitting in the Dean's Conference Room right now, and he's really glad to be able to join all of you. Uh, we first met, I think it's 2015, maybe, um, when Maximus was a professor at University of Pretoria and I was still at University of Oregon, and we were both doing work in the area of disability and access, especially to employment for adults with disabilities. So we made a connection then, and he since has moved on to University of Johannesburg, and of course I'm here at UC Davis, but we've continued to have a relationship around specific research that we're interested together, but also broader. Um, Maximus and colleagues are building a new center for young adults and children with neurodevelopmental disabilities that will be at their Soweto campus. And so he is here along with his colleague, Anthony Brown, to um, work with us this week, meet with some of our center directors and spend some time at the Mind Institute and continue to grow this partnership that really started as a single research project. And so now we're really looking at cross collaboration. I'll say two other things about Professor Safotha while he's getting set here. Um, that is, he has been a country convener for South Africa for the International Research Networks, um, which is part of the World Educational Research Association. And uh, his recent research is really focused on neurodevelopmental learning needs, and he's been working with mental health practitioners, occupational therapists, educational psychologists, teachers, and parents. Uh, in building out this center that's focused on youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities. And he's been the lead on the partnership with us here at UC Davis. So we'll give him a moment and then we'll get started. Thank you. Hello everyone, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Lindstrom and uh, Dr. Martinez for the warm, warm welcome. And thank you everybody. I am going to be talking about a an approach that um, in, in research is only beginning to make inroads as such. But this is the philosophy of Ubuntu in research and being um, of an African origin, it speaks very much to me. Allow me to say that um, this is a research that is a, a philosophical research that is inclusive more than being seen to be exclusive and particular to a, a, a specific region per se um, in Africa. I would like to start by saying that um, in recognition of why the interest in philosophy in research, we take cue from UNESCO, which itself actually celebrates um, the research day, because it recognized that there is a place of philosophy in the doctor of philosophy, and that philosophy drives the invest investigative process. But most of the time, we are not um, privy to this. And I always start by saying, let's start from a very um, individual, if one would want to look at it that way, of a researcher themselves. Many of us hold the degrees that we call doctor of philosophy, doctor of this PhD in this PhD in that. But if you were to ask many of us, what does it really mean? We don't think that much in terms of those because we're happy to have this particular um, degree. But what is important is the realization, the recognition of the centrality of research, um, of philosophy in research. As I said, um, from the UNESCO side, uh, this year, the World Philosophy Day will be celebrated on the uh, 17th of, of November. The importance of this now leads us to ask the question, what is this Ubuntu philosophy? And uh, it has been researched quite extensively, but looking at it from where the Bantu speaking people um, come from, uh, by way of context. The shaded blue on, on the African map is the representation of the Bantu speaking people. 
And uh, the word Ubuntu, therefore, comes from that particular um, diversity, as it were, that we can see from the African continent. And uh, a lot of what has happened historically would point us to the fact that also here where we are in, the, in America, there had been those transatlantic movements that brought people from the Bantu speaking um, groupings into, so which means this philosophy is actually the philosophy of humanity as we, were, as we would like to look at it. And a story is told of uh, a, a group of young people uh, who were you know, interrogated and uh, observed by an anthropologist. This comes from the Osani um, tribe in the Congo, where they said um, this man decided to test the essence of who these children were. And he gave them a basket of fruits and uh, put it somewhere afar and said, anyone who would run and get that for themselves can enjoy the goodies. And as we see the, in this picture, the children instead held hands together and ran together towards the basket full of fruit, sat together and enjoy it, uh, enjoyed it equally. And that struck the anthropologist to say, but why? And the answer from the group was that if any one of us enjoys and the rest are not enjoying, there is no sense of humanity. And that is where now the Ubuntu becomes um, central to um, the way of life, because we say that philosophy is actually the worldview, one's worldview, it's how you see the world. And all of us have a, a way of uh, looking at uh, what we refer to as Ubuntu. One of the great men of our era had been um, our eminent pro, uh, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who just passed away not long, no, so, so, so long ago. He says that Ubuntu speaks of the very essence of being human. That's why when I started, I said, the philosophy of Ubuntu is the philosophy of inclusion. <clears throat> it looks at everyone where we are and says, what is your role that you can play in the well-being of uh, humanity? And again, Ramos as one of the uh, prolific um, researchers in, in Ubuntu says that Ubuntu is the root of African philosophy. Um, the being of an African in the universe is inseparably anchored into Ubuntu. So this is the essence of who the African people are. But as I said, to me now, it transcends only the African um, continent, but it looks at the humanity of human beings where they are um, around the world. Um, distinctive characteristics of Ubuntu is that it is a philosophy. It is seen also as a human, as African, humanism, and it is an ethic. Look at what those uh, children did. They said, together, we must enjoy. And this is probably part of what we are losing in our um, um, social fabric now, that the ethics seem to be going the other way. Now people are looking at what they can get for themselves instead of the communal um, well-being and uh, as, as we said, the, 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 the promotion of that enjoyment of what we can get as, as resources. And as we say, it is a worldview. So if it is a worldview, therefore we know that um, it becomes then a paradigm. And uh, I always refer to a paradigm as driven by a philosophy, uh, whichever philosophy we can choose, but in this aspect, let's assume we are talking about the philosophy of Ubuntu as driving the paradigm. And if any paradigm is subsumed by an ontology, which refers to the reality 
of the people. So in this case, we are looking at research in terms of what is the reality of people under, under Ubuntu. And also the epistemology, which is the way of looking at how do we um, get to know that re reality and the methodologies that we use. And also it, it is underpinned by the aspect of axiology. This axiology always speaks to the ethics. When I go and research on people, uh, am I driven by the ethics of Ubuntu, which say respect the other person and give them a benefit of what we are doing. And under this also, we look at meta theory, theories, theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks. I want to look at one of the scholars who is here in the United States, but was part of the University of uh, Johannesburg where we come from, Professor um, Teresa um, Asilumumba. She is the, uh, the, the scholar who has driven the Ubuntu paradigm and says that it is articulated as an alternative framework or defining relations within and across the borders. This is what gets me to say now we're moving from local to global. Hence why I referred to it earlier as transcending only the African space. And it's being looked as a, at as a permanent corrective measure that can offer possibilities of growth and renewal. Um, we use um, the metaphor of the sunk of a bed in um, this aspect to say, some people might ask, it sounds like Ubuntu is um, an old, you know, we are looking at the traditional ways of looking at things, but the sunk of a bed uh, looks at the possibility of growth and renewal. And it says that while it is um, in motion, Look, looking in the in the past, it keeps on moving forward while looking back to take stock of what was happening so that it doesn't go blindly into the future. And this is where we want to promote the aspects of Ubuntu in research. And then again, um, the, the central part here is that we are looking at African and universal, not only African and it ends only on the African soil because it is, as I said, a paradigm of inclusion and not about othering, you know, the rest of, of the world. This is because in research now, some people have, you know, decided to go the decolonial way and uh, it looks like at that particular spot, we are beginning to point fingers at others. Whilst from the Ubuntu perspective, we are saying, how can we build going forward? I have alluded to this, but I want now to look at the Afro Afrocentric philosophy of education and research and say that Asante defined this Afri Africology as the African centric study of phenomena that relates to the ontology we spoke of and events, ideas and personalities related to Africa. And yet we are saying under this research methodology, we are not excluding, but including. And uh, two approaches that we can use to look at how we develop our beliefs is that one is rational and the other one is empirical. The rational one is more related to philosophy because it looks at logic, it looks at reasoning, and it looks at sitting back and thinking, does the reality of that African person give them an opportunity to use their logic, to resolve their problems, to use their reasoning, to allow themselves to make conclusions about their lives. And the, the sitting and thinking, people always think that it's not a methodology, it's not a method that can be trusted. But lo and behold, when you look at the empirical side, that's where philosophy also um, has actually become foundational in terms of 
looking at the experiences, observation, and going and looking into things. Instead of saying we are looking at this as polarities, we are saying what could be important in terms of bringing these aspects together so that we are looking at best ways of uh, doing research under uh, Ubuntu. And uh, I look also at the forms of reasoning, which are the abductive, deductive, and uh, um, inductive. We look at these from the fact that they form um, the basic forms of inference that inform the research methodologies. And that is why from where I started, I've been emphasizing the centrality of philosophy in research. If we look at um, the debates that are ranging on, they look at these differences between abduction, deduction, and uh, um, induction. But also there is this hypothetic, uh, hypothetical deductive method that is also in play. What are we talking about here? Deduction in, uh, looks at the inference from a general principle to the law um, uh, or law to individual instances. This is, this is critical and important because how then can we talk of deduction from um, a, in a Ubuntu perspective? The Bantu will tell you that if we, we look back at the metaphor that we use, the children, generally they are saying this is the principle that allows us to be people. But also we cannot um, make room, uh, not, not make room for the individual uh, perspective where now we are looking at several instances that look towards a general law. Those individual experiences, how do they feed in to a general way of looking at research and uh, informing what we are doing. And then abduction talks about you know, the fact that it serves to identify possibil uh, possibilities of explanations for a set of observations that would pragmatically help us to resolve our problem. In academic writing, so deduction, induction, and ab abduction can be read as models of argumentation, whereby deduction again helps us to find data to support the, argue, the arguments that we make. And then induction helps us find an argument to explain the same. I'm sure now at the level of PhD, you are beginning to make sense of what is going on here in terms of where do I place myself in terms of the type of reasoning that I'm injecting into um, my proposal, if you are still writing at the proposal level, or if it's a report, how do I link this um, to how I am arguing uh, in, my, in, my, in my study? And abduction is about supplying a warrant that enables us to move from data to argument. Most of the time, we, we fail um, to, to allow, to help our students to make this link. Now we have gone to the, to the field we have collected data, but what is the link between the data that we have collected, analyzed, and the argument that we have been making? And it is under abduction that we are able to, to look at that. So the hypothet hypothetical deductive reasoning, again, as we said, is a method of one of the mainstays of scientific research. This has been the way to go, because often is, it was the, regarded as the only true scientific research method. But we are saying under the philosophy of Ubuntu, perhaps there are other ways of, of looking at things differently, and those should be allowed within the space of, of research, hence why we are talking about the philosophy of Ubuntu. It says under hypothetical deductive reasoning, that uh, the hypothesis must be falsified, you know, if we are looking at the scientific method, but never can they be fully confirmed because 
refined methods always change, as we know, and it becomes critical and important. It helps, again, if we look at the bird, the Sankofa bird, to say, what works in the past? How can we find inroads to support it, to use it to support the research that we are doing now? Now, I'm going to share a model that I developed in terms of uh, juxtaposing what I referred to as the research under Ubuntu paradigm, looking at ontology, epistemology, and axiology. And uh, in this model, we can see if we go to look at the Ubuntu paradigm canons, they link very well with what has been developed, not under Ubuntu, but under other paradigms which speak of ontology, epistemology, and axiology. And here, let's start with the um, ontology under the general philosophical, um, philosophical research way of looking at things and look at how it is applied under Ubuntu. Under Ubuntu, we refer more to canons that help us. Yeah, these canons are general principles that are agreed amongst African nations in terms of how they see reality. In that year, the ontology, instead of looking at reality, under Ubuntu, we look at people's experiences. Again, let's refer back to the cycle of the children we saw. Their experience taught them that sharing is important, that sharing of resources allows everyone to feel to be part of um, the community. If we are looking only at reality and reality can be so objectified and be out there, not necessarily talking about the experiences of people. We are saying under a canon called Ukweli, now people, people's experiences come, become central to to research. And this is what, you know, globally is being accepted now, that instead of looking at the objective experiences of what we assume to be research, let's talk to people themselves and get those subjective experiences and find out what is it that uh, it, it's, uh, it, it allows us to understand research better. When we come to epistemology, it says here under the Ubuntu canon that we are looking at an, a canon called Kudrita, which is the structure of knowledge. This here, this specifically here, becomes a bone of contention. I referred to the decolonization of um, the curriculum a little bit earlier, and some people feeling that you know, instead of uh, um, accepting the reality that humanity has gone through and moving out of it in a way that becomes constructive, they still want to knock on doors that would say, well, this was not just, this was not that, this was not done, this was not. But under the Ubuntu paradigm, it is saying, let's look at the structure of knowledge and find out how is this structure allowing us to do research such that we have what we call epistemic balance. Epistemic balance in a sense that it allows different knowledge structures from around the world to form part of the central way of how we construct knowledge in research. I refer to, to it as a, a bit contentious because of uh, the so-called, um, the ways that um, research has been used to exclude instead of including. And we are saying that under the Ubuntu paradigm, we would rather more, uh, embrace more knowledge structures from across the world in order to inform better what we are doing. This is why, uh, as we said, the, trans, the transatlantic movement, movement that happened 
is so many hundred years ago, um, if anyone, any individual feels that their knowledge um, structure, wherever they are, can help humanity to become a better place um, to be at this particular point in time, it can be very helpful. The, in terms of axiology, we are looking at what we call uh, utulivu or ukahi, which means justice and harmony. Justice and harmony um, in relation to how we, we, we do research. Um, a, a lot of examples can be um, uh, gleaned from here where we, we could ask questions. As I said, earlier on, um, some hegemonic um, attitude could be looked at, but do they necessarily um, promote justice? Do they necessarily promote harmony in terms of how we do research? If not, Ubuntu is saying, let's use justice as a yardstick a to say, Yes, we are conducting research. Are we conducting research with and for the people, for their own well-being, or most of the time for us academics to, to promote ourselves and leave the people at levels where they, they, they were before the research happened? Or are we saying that we are going to use this research to elevate the well-being of uh, the people who are going to be including in, in research so that they feel also that the information that we got from them promotes social justice, promotes harmony, so that eventually they become part of a global village, a global um, academic research village that says, we are together in resolving problems of humanity, but not necessarily become, becoming segregated and individualistic in how we, we approach issues. I think, um, Chair, at this moment, I would like to stop so that we can allow um, some discussion and maybe clarifications here and there where they could be required. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, if um, at all time allows, we would like more engagement um, in terms of uh, the philosophy of Ubuntu and how it is making inroads into, into research. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sfoto, for your talk. Um, wanna... This is... On Zoom, we usually give the applause, so I hope you can see. That. <laughs> um, I want to open it up for folks to ask Dr. Sifoto any questions you may have. Margarita, is that a question? I I do, but I think okay. Jenny had her hand up first. Oh, okay, so I'll go after Jenny. <laughs> I was like doing. Like, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't see that. Thank like, you. No, no, that's not what I do. I'm supposed to use my hand raised. Sorry about that. Um, hi, Dr. Sifotho. Sifotho. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering, I noticed in um, uh, something that I was really interested in hearing more um, that you also showed in your uh, visualization that uh, the slide that was just up was um, perhaps locating technology within the um, this approach and this philosophy. And um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. Uh, my research is around um, learning and technology and thinking about how technology and these kinds of new cultural tools can support equitable learning opportunities. Um, and I, you know, I'm really uh, fascinated to think about, um, you know, how can we be more expansive in, uh, in our approaches to tools? And it sounds like uh, what you are doing is also, you know, is very expansive. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do I respond, Doctor, or? Sure, you, want to you can go ahead and respond. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for, for, for bringing that question up. Um, 
one of the things that um, happened was that um, uh, I eventually coined a term called techno pedandragogy. That is what you are referring to in the, into the in the model, because when COVID nineteen hit, like what we experienced in the year two thousand in terms of education for all, most teachers were not prepared to include technology or nor most populations in the far flung areas, rural, you know, poverty stricken areas would have access to technology. And the question is, um, are we still talking about access and becoming using the axiology of Ubuntu to say, we are spreading the technology equally so that even the most disadvantaged are able to access uh, education during the pandemic when we were not able to go into classes. And we found that that was not the case. Now, a, a few models that came out was that in the context of South Africa, we found now the community halls beginning to be used to allow that space for people to access um, the internet and allow the, and the government was really very helpful in terms of uh, the universities funding uh, accessibility for students to continue to, to learn, providing data for them. And we thought that was very helpful, but the person who was still left behind was the teacher who is not trained in using um, the technology. And yet also there was a, a lot of support in that and uh, a lot of teachers and parents also felt quite at the loss in terms of how do we now even help our children when we are at home with them and they need to deal with technology. It is a growing area into which we are saying the space is there, but how do we look at it such that it helps improve research, but ultimately improve the livelihoods, the well-being of, of our, our learners. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. I think those are those are questions I'm wrestling with too. So I Thank appreciate you. your comments. Thank you so much. We had a question from Margarita. Yeah, I I want to thank you for that wonderful talk, Dr. Sofoto. I was asking about you, you talked a little about the decolonization and that language that's used often. And I think you said something about, you know, this idea of not pointing a, a finger and not excluding, but including. And I know that's something that uh, in working with a few indigenous communities here, that's something that we've been having conversations as well about. And I wanted, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about that, about using the term decolonization and how. Okay. Yeah. Um... Let me start by acknowledging that decolonization is not my field, but looking at the issue of the approach, the philosophical worldview of Ubuntu, in itself it says that we promote human beings where they are. Now, decolonization in my understanding is a discourse that says something went wrong somewhere. So we need to change that which has gone wrong. A question that was asked by one of my students in a research seminar at one point become, became very challenging to me. She said, and this is a minister uh, who was in that particular class, she says, we are decolonizing from what to what? What is it that we are trying to achieve? And uh, I found that very challenging. And I said to myself, perhaps in my own approach, a better way of looking at, at issues from the perspective of Ubuntu is to acknowledge that a lot in our world has gone wrong. Instead of the Ubuntu digging back and saying, uh, what has gone wrong? How do we then build 
for the better world from where we are today. This is why I said Ubuntu for me is more inclusive mm -hmm. than just saying you did me wrong. So this is the way also I'm going to be trying to settle the scores as, as it were. It perpetuates for me an ongoing debate that says ultimately we are pointing fingers at one another instead of holding hands like those children to say we are going for a better world together. I may have been too metaphorical in this one, but that's how I say I'm looking at it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, greetings. It's wonderful to have you here. And um, I, I read into what you're telling us uh, the struggle that we also have with our students, which is helping them to understand the role of theory uh, in their research and to be clear about how that theory is informing their work and um, how they're building on it. So what I'm intrigued by is I know South Africa has many languages. Yes. And that we also um, are trying, as we try to be more inclusive, we want people to use the linguistic resources they have available to them sure. um, in order to express themselves as sure. effectively as possible. Sure. So I'm intrigued with how you foster your graduate students mm -hmm. in navigating language. Mm -hmm. Like what language do you encourage them to write in? And when mm -hmm. they write to teachers, because we sometimes do that here, mm -hmm. what languages do they use for that communication? Okay. Um, let, let me start from a, a bigger picture. The bigger picture is that now um, the academia is open to say in South Africa, if someone wants to write a PhD in their own mother tongue, let them do so. Mm. Um, I, I know of uh, several Kosa speaking people whose PhDs are now out there published. And uh, as a researcher myself, I have um, peer reviewed several papers published in local languages. This is where the richness of what I referred to in terms of the ontology and the experiences of people come in because the reality of someone cannot be translated if it is not said in their own language that they understand, because language is the career of culture and vice versa. And it explains sometimes aspects of that experience, which we cannot harness once we translate into a different language. But in their own language, it, it, it carries much uh, more deeper and richer weight than as, as it were. This is why now coming to my own individual um, uh, supervision strategies, I try to say to my students, when you think of theories, think back into your own culture. What are they, for example, the um, theories that have been used to teach us about our culture over time. Those are very important. For example, in the sphere of uh, proverbs, proverbs in our African culture carry a, a, a heavily laden and philosophically deep um, uh, um, connotations and meanings that we do not actually interrogate sufficiently. But once we do that, a student then realizes that, wow, I didn't realize that in my own culture, there is this much richness. And once they in, in include that at the level what, of what I refer to as their own theoretical framework, no, no, sorry, their own conceptual framework that they can develop as they go on, then research, research becomes even much more richer. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. 
might have time for one additional question. Well, on a more personal matter, um, what brings you to the US right now and how long are you st staying? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm here at the um, institutional visit to UC Davis. I think uh, this is the second time I come. Um, my relationship with Dean Lindstrom, Lindstrom started when she was still at, uh, at Oregon. Again, it's research that uh, brings me here. But um, beyond research, we are trying to establish a center for neurodiversity in South Africa. And the bigger drive is to learn and compare notes with what is happening in your space so that um, together, again, we can help humanity become a better place to be. I think that's a hand. Thank you so much. Yes, there's one more question. Anthony. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I am a colleague of, just want to, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Right. So I'm a colleague of Professor Sefoto, and we both at the uni from the University of Johannesburg, um, visiting uh, Professor Lindstrom here at UC Davis. Um, I absolutely am thrilled by your presentation. We are sitting in the same venue, so there might be some sort of echo here. <laughs> I just want to ask the question around inclusion and Ubuntu. Inclusion could be very problematic in many ways. Include from where into what? And when we include who is excluded, whose norms, rules, values are followed? And I'm asking this particularly because my research is in sexuality education and sexual diversity. So largely about LGBT identities. And there is a major discourse around how un-African LGBT identities are, the violence towards them, it's seen as a Western import, and hence there's a discourse around decolonization. And so the notion of Ubuntu-ness. Hello? You guys ready for us or? We're busy with it. Oh, you're just going in. Yeah. So the notion of Ubuntu-ness, how far does it stretch when the people differ from the broad or the mainstream identities of what is considered Ubuntu. Um, that is a big challenge for me because I was thinking, how do we queer Ubuntu? How do we queer inclusion? Because often this is perceived as an African. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chair. I think that's the last question. Yeah. Um, people are already shouting, they're waiting for us outside, but let me try this. Um, I will approach it from the following aspect. Human reality is a complex matter. Existence is complex in itself and how as human beings express ourselves will always be met with complexity no matter which way we turn when we are saying that uh, ubuntu has to become an inclusive space that does not say in itself that there are no anomalies in ubuntu itself but it is saying, rather than othering people, let's open up these spaces. Uh, perhaps um, to my colleague, I would like to say, we, we need to do a bit more research um, in this subject 
of sexuality and education and find out from the African experiences what used to happen. You know, in antiquity, when people found these differences, these spaces that did not allow others, how did they used to, to deal with these issues? We may be surprised to find that this is not actually anything new in Africa, because to me, it's an experience of humanity. And therefore, the inclusion part of it says, let's take what works and discard what does not work to allow humanity to, to progress towards a better understanding of itself. And uh, I would like to say that when I was looking at I work in the area of disability. I was surprised to find that um, in earlier times, there had been other ways of looking at life other than what now is claimed to be African. So I'm saying, let's go back to the drawing board. There may be a lot that we can learn from there. Thank you so much.